Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church on Sunday the 23rd of August. And this week we're continuing uh, in our series looking at stories from the seaside. And this week we're back once again at the side of the sea um, in Capernaum. Um, Jesus and his disciples have crossed back over the lake from the region of the Gerasenes where last week's story took place. And this week's passage follows on in the book of Mark exactly um, after last week's passage. Now this week's story is actually two stories um, in one. There are two miraculous healings which take place almost simultaneously. As always, I'm going to give you a kind of brief overview of the story, but I I do encourage you, um, as as I do every week, to to read the story for yourself. Um, If you don't want to do that now, then perhaps um, go and look at it later at the end of this video. This week's passage can be found um, in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. So a brief overview of the story. And and Jesus, uh, whose fame has been spreading throughout the region, is surrounded by a huge crowd when he is approached by Jairus, um, a leader in the synagogue who falls to his knees and begs Jesus to come to his house with him and to heal his daughter, who is, uh, who is seriously ill. As he's on his way with Jairus, still surrounded by the crowd who presumably are kind of tagging along for the chance to see one of Jesus' miracles live and kind of in the flesh, Jesus feels someone touch him and the healing power flow out of him and into whoever it was who touched him. He stops and he asks who it was that touched his cloak and his disciples are kind of astonished that he's asking this question as the crowd is all around them and presumably they're all getting kind of bumped and banged as they walk and so it could have been any one of a kind of great number of people who has touched Jesus. We're told however that it was a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years and who has spent all she has on doctors, but whose condition has continued to get worse. Verses 27 and 28 of the passage say this. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. And she is. As soon as she touches Jesus' cloak, her bleeding stops and she feels in her body that she has been healed. Now, following Jesus asking who it was that touched him, she comes forward and admits that it was her falling to her knees in front of him. And verse 34 says, He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now at this point Jairus must have probably been tearing his hair out um, at this interruption Um, and it kind of appears that his worst fears have indeed come true as messengers come from his house and tell Jairus that his daughter has died and that in the circumstances he should not trouble Jesus any longer. However Jesus Jesus, tells Jairus uh, do not fear only believe and he continues to the house allowing only Peter James and John to follow him now as they get to the house they find people weeping and wailing loudly but Jesus tells them not to make a commotion as the child is merely sleeping he then goes into the child's room takes her by the hand and says little girl get up verse 42 tells us immediately the girl got up and began to walk about she was 12 years of age at this they were overcome with amazement now similar to last week there is a huge amount isn't there going on here in this story or stories as there are two intertwined but distinct miracles happening here And therefore it's not really possible to fully do justice to everything within the passage in just this one short video. And so I'm going to just focus on two things that stand out to me as I read this passage. The first thing that strikes me 
is the difference in stature between the two people who approach Jesus, but yet the same way they behave when faced with him. See, we're told, aren't we, that Jairus is a leader in the synagogue. He has a position of authority. He would have been respected and looked up to. His was a position of influence and importance. Certainly, I imagine that he was not familiar with the need to beg anyone for help. In fact, it would almost certainly have usually been the other way around, with people coming to him, asking for his help, and hoping that he would show them kindness and compassion. However, in this moment, all of that goes out of the window. He doesn't approach Jesus as a leader. He doesn't come to him as a man of authority, but instead he comes as a father. A father of a girl who is ill, a girl who is dying, a desperate father who has run out of options and who is now on his knees before Jesus, begging, pleading for help and hoping beyond hope that Jesus shows him kindness and compassion. Similarly, the woman falls on her knees before Jesus, desperate and with nothing but hope. But yet she comes from a very different place, doesn't she? As a woman in that culture, her experience would have been um, at the opposite end from Jairus's anyway, with very little importance placed on her life because of her gender, with none of the same rights and privileges that men in that time and that place were naturally afforded. And of course, added to that, her condition would have meant that she was excluded, with no hope of a family and the protection that that might come with that. And having spent what little money she once had to try and find a cure for her condition, now she was penniless, her life would have been even harder, filled with adversity, with danger, with misery. And so, as I read this story, I'm struck by the fact that Despite our culture's obsession with power and status and wealth and fame and even nationality, these are no guarantee of a life devoid of pain and of the need for help. Which then leads me to two conclusions. Firstly, it encourages me to search for the similarities between myself and others instead of focusing on the differences between us. For instance, when I see pictures of desperate parents risking their lives in search for a better future for their children, might I be moved to see past their nationality and to see their love for their children and perhaps realise that the only thing that separates their expression of parental love from mine is good luck and circumstance. Might I be moved to show kindness and compassion at all times and to see others the way that God sees them? And secondly, it encourages me to realise that no amount of money, no position or status, nor even any amount of good deeds can remove my need for God. In the communion liturgy that we used last week, we say that we approach God's table not because any goodness of our own gives us a right to come, but yet how often we like to allow ourselves to believe that we are good. To perhaps look down on others and to somehow believe that we are more deserving of God's love than them. The Bible tells us that we all fall short of the glory of God and therefore we all approach God desperate and in need of mercy and compassion. May we never allow our pride to obscure our need for God nor to see others as beyond his grace. However, having said that, it's also important to move on to the second thing that stands out to me from this passage. 
Now, the Jews had really strict purity laws, and there were any number of things that could cause you to be um, considered unclean. In particular, blood was considered to be unclean, and women were considered unclean and were to be set apart for seven days during menstruation. And anyone who even touched her during this time would themselves be considered unclean for the rest of the day. And so for the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, that was 12 years of separation. 12 years of being considered unclean. 12 years of isolation with no physical contact of any kind. Similarly, dead bodies were considered to be the most severe of all that was considered to be unclean, with anyone touching a corpse becoming themselves unclean and then defiling anyone or anything that they subsequently touched. In both of the healings in today's passage, there is a touch involved. The woman who had been bleeding for 12 years reaches out and touches Jesus. And in the case of Jairus' daughter, Jesus reaches out and holds the hand of the deceased girl. And in both cases, a transformation from death to life takes place. Quite literally in the case of Jairus' daughter, but also in the story of the woman who goes from isolation and desperation to healing and wholeness and being named daughter. And in neither case does the uncleanliness transfer and taint Jesus, but rather his holiness transfers and makes them clean. And so whilst it's true that we do all need God, and we all approach him desperate and in need of grace and compassion, it is also true that he is sufficient for all that we need. That he can take whatever state we are in and can transform death to life, polluted to purity, isolation to acceptance. Now, I don't know what it is that you are carrying. I don't know what your life holds or has held. What secrets you have buried deep inside. But I do know that Jesus wants to give you new life. And that there is nothing and no one that is too tainted, too tarnished or too far gone for Jesus to be able to help and to be able to restore them. And so might you know the transforming touch of Jesus on your life today. Might you know what it is to be loved and accepted. And might you in turn show that love and compassion to all that you meet. Amen.